I'm Dr. Mark Solomon, and in this video, I want to take you through the entirety of a robotic sigmoid resection from skin to skin, showing you the high points. But not only that, I want to show you some of the parts that are typically edited out of videos, which are the transitions between the critical segments of an operation. And speaking of critical segments of the operation, I have in previous videos broken down this operation into 21 steps. And if you haven't seen those videos, I do suggest you watch them either before or after this video. And while you're at it, please make sure you subscribe to the channel and click the bell to receive notifications for when I add content to this channel and many other series on this channel as well. Little case context, this is a middle-aged Caucasian female with a rectosigmoid adenocarcinoma that has a tattoo in it and some filmy lateral adhesions. And really what I want to do is again walk you through the choreography of this operation, putting the entire thing together from start to finish. So let's get the video started. This is about an hour from start to finish but I'm going to speed through certain segments of the operation like the setup and certain more mundane parts of the operation. The very first thing that I end up wanting to do in these cases is restore the normal anatomy. What I always tell my fellows and anyone that will listen, step zero of the operation is to restore normal anatomy that includes dividing any of these lateral attachments. So these aren't really that bad, but really what you want to do is you want to make sure that these lateral attachments are taken down so that you can set yourself up from medial to lateral dissection as you elevate the rectosigmoid junction in an anterior orientation. And basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to tent the IMA pedicle at a 90 degree angle to the aorta. And the only way that you can do this is if the lateral attachments are taken. So this one isn't that bad, but in bad diverticulitis cases, you really got to get those lateral attachments lysed so that you can pull up the rectosigmoid junction at a right angle. And right here, we're just doing basically some lateral attachment dissection looking for the interdigitating sigmoid fossa and immediately deep to that fossa is the left ureter. So we're going to continue this dissection. I'll speed up the video just a touch. Put on 2x some of those lateral attachments. And this is pretty good at this point. I could probably transition now to a medial dissection. And in just a second, you'll see the left ureter. All right, so here, this is where now I'll begin to go medially. And this is the, really the start of the case. What you're trying to do here is you're trying to tent the rectosigmoid junction anteriorly, as you see. Bring the third arm of the robot in. Let me back that video up just a little bit so you see it. Backing up. Go forward. The rectosigmoid junction gets tented anteriorly by having the third arm come underneath the second arm, fanning out the mesentery and lifting up on the IMA pedicle. Once that's done, you may have to readjust just a little bit, begin coming underneath. That's the best way to exchange those instruments to and from to avoid internal and external collisions. Once things are tented up nicely, look for the sacral promontory. And what I do is I lift up the mesosigmoid and the uh, rectosigmoid junction. And I'm looking for, I'll pause the video right here because it shows it pretty well. You'll see that there's the, me the mesorectum here, which is this light yellowish color versus this darker yellowish color in this patient. What I'm going to do here is I'm jiggling the peritoneum and I'm trying to predict the junction between that retroperitoneum and the mesorectum. And that's the exact point right there along that line right there that I'm going to want to make that medial lateral incision. So you'll see here and you're going to get a big plume of, big plume of uh, uh, pneumodissection into the presacral space. Jiggling the peritoneum, making an incision, some pneumodissection. We'll start kicking in right there. So that's the start of the medial to lateral section. Now, if you have seen the videos on the 21 steps of a lower anterior section, it's very similar to a sigmoid section, uh, with the exception of the entirety of the mesorectal section and the diverting loop ileostomy. And the immediate thing that I do here right when I start the medial lateral is I identify the hypogastric nerves and I preserve them by pushing them down. So the, the hypogastric nerves get immediately identified, get pushed down, Third arm hasn't moved. Second arm really isn't doing much other than lifting up the mesorectum directly anteriorly. I'm going to poke my left hand in, spread my left hand in, and then lift my left hand. So that poke, spread, and lift maneuver you will see constantly throughout every single one of my operative videos. Poke, spread, and lift right there. And what that does is it prevents you from giving a more of a, uh, an aggressive lifting maneuver and ripping or shredding any of the mesentery. Poke, spread, lift. And what I'm doing here is I'm looking for the left ureter. And as you see what I'm doing, I first headed into the presacral space. I'm looking for the left ureter still. Haven't found it quite yet. But I'm doing so in a cephalad and lateral manner. So as soon as I find 
the, the areolar tissue plane. I start pushing that down, push the hypogastric nerves down. Looking for the left ureter. I'm going to keep poking, spreading, lifting, and there's a left ureter right there. All right, up there. I just point it with my mouse. And I'm going to continue this mesorectal and mesosigmoid dissection proximally until I can get all the way to the takeoff of the IMA from the aorta. So I'm going to speed the video up just a smidge. You see, I'm going to exchange the third arm to lift up the dissection point. I'm going to keep chucking. I'm going to keep uh, moving up proximally, taking down these embryological attachments, peeling the IMA off of the retroperitoneum and off of the aorta. And I'm looking for the junction of the IMA and the aorta and the T-shaped takeoff. And what I mean by T-shaped, the aorta is kind of the base. The IMA is the base of the T. And the horizontal aspects of the T are the superior mortal heading to the right and the left colic heading to the left. Again, the third arm coming and lifting up. Aorta is down at the bottom of the screen. IMA is right here. Trying to make that right angle. Make it look like a T. So the lymph node I just burned right there. Coming around this corner here. I'm trying to look and create a window around the IMA pedicle. Doing this with the scissors. Keep working our way around. Trying to create a window around the IMA here. And now you can see right there that window was just created. Below me is the aorta. Above me is the meso descending colon, descending mesocolon rather. So these areolar tissue attachments. Just deep to that is going to be the, the IMV. You can see the IMV right there. And the IMA right there in our face. Just proximally to the left here, left the screen, is going to be the left colic artery. To the right here, this is where the IMA changes name to the superior hermortal. So this right here, from down here to about right there, this may be... Let's call that two to three centimeter stump is the IMA pedicle itself. I'm going to come around it and divide it with the vessel sealer. Now, I made extremely light edits in this video just uh, so the instrument exchanges aren't so painful. So, no, I don't have a magical robot or a magical assistant. That uh, instrument exchange did take some time. I'm going to come across it. I'm a little bit obsessive with how I divide my vessels. I typically seal uh, about four times, check the seal to make sure it's okay. And then uh, cut it. And I edited that out as you see. All right. Once that pedicle is divided, I hand the divided IMA pedicle to my third arm and lift it directly north or directly anterior to the anterior abdominal wall. I'm going to speed the video up a little bit and then continue my medial dissection by pushing down the retroperitoneal structures, pushing in left ureter, pushing down gerota, gerota's fascia. Continue heading laterally. It's not uncommon that I'll get a little bit too deep or a little bit too superficial. And anytime you see bleeding, it means you're in the wrong plane. So I continue in this lateral dissection. Now, what's what's a you know this patient's skinny? There's no doubt. I'm not going to lie about that. But even in heavier patients, the descending mesocolon is actually very thin. So it's it's a good idea to make sure that you're not going too deep, digging too deep. And look at that nice little plane right there. Every patient has this. And in general, you want to make sure that all the blood vessels are going down and then the yellow stuff is going up. So I'm a little too deep in this patient. So eventually I'm going to have to come through that bridging mesenteric vessel, that retroperitoneal vessel, bring it down. There, it's coming down there. I got too deep. I'm going to make up for it by dividing it and then pushing it down, trying to restore the actual embryological plane. I'm going to keep working my way laterally. And watch what I do with my third arm here. I'm starting to use it more. I'm going to poke, spread, lift with my third arm. Poke, spread, and lift. Pushing down the retroperitoneal attachments. Working my way as lateral as I possibly can. And I'll do this until I've really gotten as much lateral mobilization and proximal mobilization as I need. So this is one of the main reasons why I actually don't take flexure down every single case. Because... I find that if you do enough of this medial mesenteric mobilization, taking off the descending mesocolon, essentially off of the aorta, what this affords is plenty of mesenteric length. And of course, you got to get lateral length, but getting lateral length is not that difficult. 
um, it's the medial link that usually holds you up or the medial attachments. So if you take the mesenteric insertion points high enough, the entire descending mesial colon and left colon will slide down into the pelvis, mitigating a lot of the times the need for a splenic flexor mobilization. But there's no doubt I still have to take it down. I just don't have to take it down every case. As you see, this lady had a, a pretty floppy um, sigmoid descending colon. So we're getting enough length there. I'm going to bring in my scissors and I pick a midpoint. Let me pause just for a second here. So once I've done all that medial dissection, you saw IMV back there just a little bit ago. I don't necessarily take the IMV in every single case. Let me back the video up a little. If I wanted to take the splenic flexor down, what I would have done after IMA division, I would have continued in this direction here to the left of screen. There's duodeno jejunal junction to your left. And I would have continued to the left, i.e. cephalad, and taken down the IMV as well. And if that wasn't enough to get me to where I needed, I would have then gone to the to the uh, above the pancreas and I have a video that I'll link in the description and then the card above showing the next steps on how to take a splenic flexure down. Once I've done the medial dissection, as far as I need to go, proximal and distally, I'm going to go now laterally. Put my scissors in and then I'm going to basically pick a point on the mid part of the lateral attachments, anywhere, doesn't really matter, just getting a white line and basically make a nice full thickness incision into my previously dissected medial plane. So I'm trying to mature the dissection to meet the dissection that I did medially. I'm now trying to find it laterally. And look, there's nothing else other than some filmy lateral attachments. So I'm taking these lateral attachments from top to bottom, rather in this case, from the midpoint of the sigmoid, say, all the way up as proximally as I need to go. In this case, I'm probably going to head up to the splenic flexure, but not take the entire flexure down. Take all this down. That's a pretty quick uh, dissection here because we've done a lot of the work immediately. And then once I've done that approximately as far as I need to go, I'm gonna, now going to go distally. So I'm going to meet my midpoint, wherever I started at the midpoint on the left. And then I'm going to enter in the precircle space and just continue dividing the lateral attachments as far distally as I need to go. And typically in this case, in these cases, I'll take that down to the either the parent reflection or just basically to meet where I started the dissection on the right hand side. So wherever I started the medial lateral dissection, I want to even out the dissection. So it's a good it's a, it's a good practice to maintain symmetry at all times in all these cases, especially a low anterior section. And it's critically important that when you start doing this stuff, you have to maintain symmetry, especially when you're doing an LAR. You've got to make sure you've done all the proximal division uh, first or proximal mobilization first. So that's the setup there for the pre-sequitur section. And uh, as you saw, what I did was I set up everything with my left and right hand. I'm going to back the camera up a little bit. I'm going to rewind it. Okay. So my left and right hand here, left hand here, right hand here set up. It pulls up the mesorectum, cephalad, or actually, actually anteriorly. The third arm is going to come in with the tip pointing away. It's going to grab the mesorectum at the, uh, at the rectus sigma junction, pinch, pull, and pull to the head. And they can see right there, it gives me exposure to the pelvis, no problem. Now I'm going to do a little bit of a TME on this case because the lady had a rectus sigmoid tumor. Even though I consider this still basically a, a, um, a uh, sigmoid section, um, it, it, it represents a lot of the, what a TME would look like as well, or tumor-specific mesorectal excision. So once I get into the pre space, this is uh, what I'm highlighting here in this video, is something that's pretty important. I highlighted in a previous video about how to do the TME. It's very easy to get too deep on the TME dissection. And we'll look at what my left hand is doing. My left hand is at a right angle, poking at the midline of the mesorectum and lifting anteriorly, kind of in a circular motion. And what I'm going to point out here how easy it is to get too deep. So I'm starting up here. It's very tempting to start down there where my mouse is mousing over. If you start down here, pretty easily you're going to scoop up the presecco venous plexus, hypogastric nerves, nervite erigenti, all sorts of bad stuff is down here. So you want to be very careful that when you start this dissection, start where the nerves are not, which are up here. So you want to make sure you're above the nerves, push the nerves down. You can kind of see the filmy nerves right there. Those are the hypogastric nerve plexus. That's where they are. You want to make sure you're above that when you start this section. And what's happening here off screen, you can't even see it, is my left hand is doing nearly all of the work. 
my left hand is at a right angle. I'm poking right in the dead center. I'm poking, I'm pushing, and I just did it there. It's almost in a circular motion. I'm poking in the midline. I'm lifting anteriorly towards the ab abdominal wall, and then I'm pulling to the head. So I'm pushing in the midline, I'm lifting anterior, and I'm pulling to the head. And I'm doing this constantly. And I'm kind of reiterating the motion after every single um, after every single repositioning maneuver here. And what you're going to see is as I'm going, I'm always starting the, the TME dissection at the dead center, right at the posterior midline. And then I'm going to mature the mesorectal dissection to the left. And the way I'm doing this is I'm pushing my left-handed instrument contralaterally. So I'm pushing it to the right. When I'm doing the left side of dissection, I'm pushing my left-handed instrument to the right. So give myself counter traction. I'm going to do the exact same thing, but opposite on the right. You see here, starting at dead center, work my way to the patient's right. And as I get to the pelvic side wall, I'm pulling the mesorectum as hard, basically as much as I can to the left. And why am I doing that? Is I'm trying to avoid entirely putting a hole in the pelvic sidewall. It's very easy to, to, to get a little too deep. So that's why it's very important to really crank that rectum to the to the opposite side, pulling it away from the pelvic sidewall. Now it looks like I'm repositioning here my third arm, which I don't normally have to do, but you know, no, you don't don't fight it, of course, if you have to. So once the looks like the one what I'm doing here is um so I think the posterior dissection is pretty much done. So now I'm going to start taking the lateral attachments. And um, lateral attachments here, taking it down to just distal to the tumor. I'll speed the video up a little bit. Going just distal to the tumor. Give myself some counter traction there. Liberal use of the bipolar. Getting below the tattoo there. And I'll do that dissection on the left. I'm going to make it symmetric and always go to the exact same thing on the right. Get it nicely set up. Always come underneath your third arm. Sorry, bring your third arm always underneath your second arm. I'm going to start working on continuing the posterior mesorectal dissection here. Always start the dead center, dead center, dead center. Work your way to the left, then work your way to the right. See the presacral venous plexus right there in the middle? Do everything you can to avoid that, obviously. And I definitely went a little bit overboard on the presacral dissection or the mesorectal dissection. But I tend to do that on my uh, on my sigmoid resections as well, even for diverticulitis, because I like getting I like being being able to straighten the rectum out, so you can it gets uh, makes the EA stapler much easier to bring up. Also it gives a decent amount of practice for myself and my fellows when we do these resections. And as you see, what we're doing now is you just went double screen here, uh, picture in picture, and we're getting the uh, the colonoscope set up. And what I'm going to do is just double check the distal margin of the tumor to make sure that there's. Uh, uh, no concern for the distal margin. And I'm just finishing up the right lateral dissection here. You see we're well below tattoo. I'm not even going to take the anterior peritoneal flexion in this case. Just got plenty of posterior mobilization done. And I'm estimating we're going to end up dividing, of course, just below the tattoo, but it was a pretty superficial uh, adenocarcinoma. And I uh, couldn't feel it or see it. All I saw was tattoo, but um, always trust but verify. Speed it up a little bit more. The scope's going in. You can see the endoscopic image to the left there. And there's the lower edge of the tumor. I'm pretty happy that we're going to end up being just below the tattoo. And indeed, I'm confirming what my gastroenterologist colleagues have um, outlined for me. We're going to then score the mesorectum. That's important here, I think, to really keep yourself honest here. And what that involves is... I circumferentially score the rectum and the mesorectum. So I'm going to actually, I just went a little bit out of frame here. You don't quite see it in this picture, but I have actually scored circumferentially, scored on the rectum itself right there. So I know exactly where to divide the mesorectum and where to divide the rectum as well. I'm doing the posterior circumferential um, scoring right now. And this is really just for more landmarks. So that when I start coming through the, meso uh, the mesorectum, 
I know exactly where I'm going, uh, so I don't skive too much. Speed this up a little bit. Now, this posterior mesorectal dissection uh, and the mesenteric division, the mesorectal division, can be done with scissors uh, or with the um, with a vessel seer. And I mean, it depends on the case and depends on the, the anatomy of the patient, but I'll typically almost always use the um, the scissors for these patients. Um, and then once, they, once if the bleeding, bleeding gets bad, or the superior hormonal is difficult to identify or, or whatever the case may be, I, I, I will liberally switch back to um, a vessel seer. But in this case, uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll basically skeletonize, skinny down and find the um, superior hormonal, divide it. Uh, with the bipolar and what here you already pretty much you can see the rectum there you know patient had very favorable anatomy of course as you can tell finding the separate hermortal dividing it bringing the vessel sealer in to to take it uh, just again the i edited out very lightly edited out the instrument exchanges in this video just to save everyone of the pain uh, waiting for the instruments to come in finishing up these mesorectal uh, attachments here doing so basically perpendicular to the rectum itself speed it up and once this is done circumferentially we're going to bring in the stapler most typical if it's a sigmoid section i will almost always use a um, blue load in this case it was since we're a proximal rectum i'm gonna guess i was using a green load but we'll find it here in a second Pretty sure it's a green load. Now one little tip here that I have, stapling. There's gonna be a time where you just can't quite get across the rectosigmoid with a single fire of a, of a 45 blue or 45 green, whatever you have. So this is the trick. I go to 100% clamp on the robot put my two arms, my left hand here, my third arm there, basically kind of straddle the stapler, make sure it's clamped down 100%, make sure you get a full clamp, and then I'm gonna open the stapler, advance it in a little bit more. There's a tip I picked up in residency that allows you to get a little bit more uh, tissue into the stapler, not forcing it or cramming it, you don't want, you definitely don't wanna do that, but just allowing that first clamp to push out any of the edema and fluid that's in the tissue, and then opening the stapler and advancing it just a little bit more affords a little bit more tissue safely within the stapler. Now we're gonna clamp down, make sure we're at 100% clamp, and then fire the stapler. Speed up the video. And now we've divided the mesorectum, We've divided the rectum. Now I'm going to find my proximal division point. Put the vessel sealer in next. I'm going to rotate that, uh, rotate the uh, sigmoid colon uh, out of the pelvis, looking for the descending sigmoid junction. I'm going to tent the descending sigmoid junction that I anticipate will be my anastomotic site. I'm going to hold that now to the anterior midline. And what I did is that once I figured out like that's a good spot for the dissection to be, I flip the specimen back into the pelvis. I'm going to now find the divided IMA pedicle. Adjusting my proximal division point. Now I'm going to find the proximal division point of my IMA pedicle. I want to keep that with the specimen because that's where all the lymphovasculature is. All the lymph nodes are harvested. There's a lymph node to the right. It was just out of frame there. Now I'm going to start double burning there with the specimen to the right, i.e. the IMA pedicle to the right. And then I'm going to, with the vessel sealer, double burn on the mesentery from that point there with the IMA pedicle all the way up to my third arm. It is incredibly important to make sure that you're using your third arm very liberal in these cases, as a reference point for where to divide the mesorectum, and the, or rather the mesosigmoid or mesodescending colon in this case. If you don't have a fixed third arm that you're referencing constantly, it's very, very, very easy, incredibly easy, and please take it from me, to deviate. You can go to the left and actually accidentally take the descending colon or the proximal aspect of it, or hang a right and end up hitting at the, um, at the rectosigmoid. So I'm using my third arm, constantly referencing it exactly where to take. 
the mesentery and which direction to point the vessel sealer so that I don't mess up the mesenteric division, which is arguably one of the more important parts of the operation. Here I'm just skinning down the final attachments of the mesentery with the vessel sealer, and I'm announcing to anesthesia I need 2.5 cc's of ICG with a 10 cc flush right now. Right, the second I take that last little bit of attachment, that's when I ask for the ICG, and in just a second, we'll see it go in. Checking for length again. It's looking pretty good. Speed the video, ICG goes in. And everything is illuminating quite nicely. Very nice. Anvo just went in now. How did that go in? Well, that's for another video, I think. But basically, what I ended up doing in that case, and pretty much all my cases now, is my bedside assist will remove the stapler port, extend the skin incision usually just a little bit, and basically, in the most delicate and elegant uh, way possible, shove the anvil in, into the abdomen. And it typically will require a little bit of a stretching of the fascia and peritoneum. Of course, larger patients, deeper uh, sub-Q is you know, a little bit more difficult, but um, whatever works typically. Now I'll do this in a couple different ways. I'll divide the descending sigmoid junction either with the scissors or the vessel sealer. Actually, I find that the vessel sealer gives you a much straighter cut, and so I, I tend to favor that way. And as you see right here, a 3 v lock just went in the abdomen. I'm probably getting a little bit impatient here, so I'm going to start suturing with a vessel sealer until my needle driver comes in, but most traditionally I'm going to use a, a needle driver, a non-cutting large needle driver, and I start at the 7 o'clock position on the, on the descending colon conduit here. And I start at the 7 o'clock position. I'll speed the video up a little bit. I'm holding up with my third arm about 4 centimeters proximal to that cuff. And once the vessel sealer, went, and, sorry, once the um, needle driver goes in, we'll get this thing completed. Needle driver goes in. I've started at the 7 o'clock position on the cuff going in to out, and then I'm going to work my way around the descending colon conduit in this cuff in an in to out fashion, sewing in the baseball stitch configuration, in to out, in to out, in to out. Now I do this in about a one, C, uh, one centimeter increment. I travel about a centimeter and take about a uh, half um, a centimeter uh, bite each time. Now I know the measurements because the fenestrated bipolar moment, which is my left-hand instrument, I've said it in different videos, my left-handed instrument, the width of it is five millimeters. Opened jaw to jaw or tip to tip is uh, two centimeters. So I kind of split the difference uh, between the two and that's about a centimeter. And I'm taking, I travel centimeter, take a half a uh, centimeter or five millimeter bite each time. And I typically go from seven o'clock Run it in a clockwise fashion, back to 7 o'clock. Once I get that done, go back to where I started. Third arm's going to grab at the 12 o'clock position. Left hand's going to pull down in the 6 o'clock position, once I get the uh, anvil. Pull down in the 6 o'clock position, get the anvil in place, cinch down the suture, Grab the descending colon conduit, cinch it down tight. Probably the majority of the cases, I end up having to do a second round with this same suture. Sometimes the cuff doesn't cinch down nice enough. And so what I'll do in this case is I'll run it around a second time with the same V-lock, and that's why I don't cut the needle off. And more and more regularly, what I do is actually take a vicral endo loop and just cinch that down real tight around the cuff of the, um, the descending colon conduit, like the, 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 the right around the base of the anvil there. And I, I've liked that more and more, but this certainly works because the suture's already in. It works nice and, looks, and it works just fine. So run around a second time here. Speed up the video a little bit. And I always like to keep the needle attached because if I find another tick, I can keep running around if I need to. 
And then what I'll do is, just like we would do in an open case, I'm going to get scissors in there. And we would clean off the mesentery in uh, these open cases when we do the excorporeal uh, fixation of the anvils. We get a right angle and start boving, and it's exactly what I'm going to do here on this robotic case. So there's nothing different. The technique is identical. It's just using a different instrument, basically. So we're going to get this set up, exchanging the third arm so I can get exposure. Skinny down the mesentery. I'll speed the video up. Getting it down nice and uh, symmetric all the way around, nice and flat. Hey, of course, you know, there's a delicate balance of not you know, burning the bowel like I just did there, and even though it's very superficial, um, and not devascularizing it, but just having it just enough to where you can see what you're doing. Getting to make sure everything's nice and hemostatic, checking the orientation, cutting the suture, handing it to my assist, and now setting up for the anastomosis. Place a specimen in the right lower quadrant, get it out of your face, and then let your assistant go down, start doing the transcendental dilatation with the EA sizers. I use a vessel here for this. Um, checking the orientation right there, IMA, I'm, actually looks like I'm going to get some more length. There's IMA, you can see it right there. Inserting to the splenic vein. It's actually a nice anatomy there. Making sure we have plenty of length, and we do. And again, we don't forget, we mobilize a ton of rectum. So the rectum comes up really nicely in this case. And, and in most cases, even the larger patients, whatever the case may be, there's plenty of mobilization of the rectum. Clean the camera off. Assistant is down, EA sizers are going up. Second sizer went up, now the stapler's gonna go up. I've got a 2x speed. Now, typically what I do is, as you see right there, I like to bring out the spike to one side of the rectal cuff. I'll link to the video the reason why, but I'll briefly say as this anastomosis is getting constructed. The less number of intersecting staple line points you can do, the better for the patient, which is why I now abhor these anastomoses where we bring the spike of the stapler through the direct midline of the stapler, of the transverse uh, staple line of the rectum, and we have the stapler on the EEA anvil side through the middle of the staple line there. So you converted something now to a quadruple staple line, intersecting staple line uh, technique. So what I do here, and, and there's several studies that support this, is bringing the anvil spike, the transanal anvil spike, through one side of the rectal cuff so that you only have one intersecting staple line point. In this case, I brought it out to the patient's left-sided stump, uh, the, the left side of the stump, and I'm checking mesenteric orientation here uh, just to make sure we're nicely oriented. And that what that does is, back to the anastomotic surface, there's only one intersecting staple line on the right-hand side here of the anastomosis, which is right to the right here. And that's acceptable. Now, again, I'll link to a, a video that I talked about this. Um, that showed an anastomotic leak rate of, actually in this study, uh, zero when you have zero intersecting staple lines or zero when you have one intersecting staple line. But when you had two intersecting staple lines, the leak rate in that study went up to 12%. So I do whatever I can to not have these intersecting staple lines occur. Speed the video up a little bit here. EA sizer gets fired. See to my left, my assist is just about to uh, bring the colonoscope up. Pelvis gets instilled with saline, clamp off with the third arm. Make sure we're hemostatic. Very, very, very liberal use of any energy down here. If, it, um, if there's any um, issues, I mean, I'll, I'll get a 3 0 Vicryl out or something like that to, to uh, suture off any bleeding, but anything superficial like that, not too bad. So I, I just re injected ICG, as you see. It looks very nicely perfused. I'm very happy with it. The rectum always comes in in terms of perfusion after the sigmoid. Very nicely perfused. And the endoscopic image on the left, you'll see 
it's not the best image, but you'll see that uh, we're uh, distending up quite nicely. It'll get nice. There's the anastomosis there. There it is. And uh, it looks intact, not bleeding. Distending up decently, actually, not the best. That's pretty much it. So I'll speed this up a little bit more. And uh, I did see that there's a little bit of a, a thermal hickey, let's call it, on the left side of the anastomosis there. So I'm going to go ahead and just put an interrupted suture just to cover that. Now, I remember this is actually a, a case observation day. Most people actually missed that. They didn't see uh, why I was doing that. But but in, now I'm reviewing the video. I'm really glad I did. Um, and that's the cool thing about robotics is that you're not really limited to like doing stuff like this. So if you ever worry about it, I just throw a stitch in it. it makes me feel a whole lot better. I sleep better, even though it probably wasn't going to be an issue. But I mean, the last thing I want to do is uh, try to get away with something. So at least I know that I did everything possible, and um, and uh, it was a, you know technically pretty easy to do. And obviously, this is in a really easy spot. But even the lower uh, even if there's a low, low, low colorectal, even a coloanal, I've, I've oversown uh, defects in the anastomosis or weaker spots in the anastomosis for these ultra-low uh, colorectal anastomoses. And you see I use the vessel seeder to suture that, which you can certainly do. Uh, the vessel seeder works as a decently off-label uh, ne needle driver. Uh, not the most uh, delicate instrument for that, but it certainly works. On clamp, now switching back to full screen view, now what I'm going to do is my vessel here is going to go away. I'm going to switch the master controls on the console here in just a second. So that arms number one and two are now my left and right hands. I dunk the specimen into a specimen bag, pull the specimen out through the extension of the staple port, and we're done with the case. All right, that about wraps up this video on a skin-to-skin -skin robotic sigmoid, but let's call it a kind of a semi low anterior section and how I do it, the choreography for the entire thing. Now, if you're interested, I have an entire video series on exactly how every single step of this operation is done into the 21 steps of the operation and how best to do it, how to do it in multiple different ways, all the different nuances, uh, tips and tricks on how to get them done. But this operation that I just showed here, I hope shows kind of how you put it all together. Let me know down in the comments if you do anything differently. And please subscribe to the channel as I'm adding content to this uh, series and many others uh, pretty regularly. Thanks. Take care.